Well, um, I guess welcome to Occupy here. Melbourne. Just like to extend our warm um, greetings to you all, like as a media team and as an occupation. Thank you so much for dropping by. Um, first up, perhaps if you could uh, speak, because I heard rumours that you had spoken to, you had uh, been on site at the San Francisco occupation. Is that true? Yeah, I'm obviously I'm not one of the tents tent people and whatnot, uh, but uh, there was a big march on Saturday, I would estimate between one and 2,000 people uh, from one end of Market Street downtown to the other, which is the main thoroughfare. The camp was outside the Federal Reserve Building, and uh, which is pretty near where the water of the bay is, and then City Hall is kind of at the other end before Market Street starts going up a hill. I don't know, one or two mile march, I don't know how long it is down there. And I was late as usual, so then I was driving around trying to find the march, and as soon as I saw the traffic jam, oh, they must be over there, because they blocked off Market Street, so I got to City Hall, and um, a tactic they're using against the occupiers in San Francisco is forbidding them to have a public address system. And so there's this... Uh, Form of communication. It sounds like you may be doing this here too. It's almost like Black, Black Baptist Church call and response, where um, uh, the person speaking with a little megaphone will say half a sentence or a short sentence, then one part of the crowd repeats it, then another part of the crowd behind them repeats it, and it's almost like a, a man, yeah, human yeah. echo, man-made echo, or a, so some sort of microphone or public address system, and. Uh, then eventually people march back from City Hall back to uh, the camp, and the camp has already been bullied off the uh, uh, federal building property, and there's a square kind of a park, although not much grass, it's more like it's gravel or something. A couple blocks down in between the end of Market Street and the ferry boat building, so uh, that's where they want to set up camp and hopefully be left alone. Ironically, uh, the city fathers in San Francisco have been, and the police have been a little more uh, hostile in the sense of trying to make sure a camp doesn't get too big or spring up than they, than they have been in New York, which is ironic considering San Francisco's reputation. Yeah. And the fact that there's a mayoral election coming almost as soon as I get home. Are you running again this time? No. No? No. Okay. <laughs> no, there's about 16 people running and we have ranked choice voting, so it's going to be interesting. Because people get to vote for their first, second, and third choice, which could mean a stealth corporate right winger may get in if there's enough first and second choices on that side. Or it could go the other way. Um, the uh, corporate media, though their tactic for several election cycles now has been to ignore local elections. Maybe push the incumbent if it's a pro-business mayor or something, but otherwise they don't talk about them. You know, because uh, they don't want people to vote, of course. And at least in America, so few people pay attention. And, uh, well, you can still get me there. <laughs> and vote in local elections. Yeah that, um, there we are, that a smaller number of people can actually make a difference. And sometimes this can be very, very negative. Like the state of California passing this thing right after I moved to California called Proposition 13, the unlucky 13, which is presented to everybody as a tax cut for the middle class. What it really was was a huge tax cut for property owners. The more property you own, the more money you can run off with. And it was the property taxes that funded the school system. So California has now gone from number one in education in, in the United States, if not the world, to number 49. They're doing better in Mississippi. They're doing better in Florida. And it's considered the beginning of this whole anti-tax movement that's caused so much trouble. At least where I come from, where people are under this impression that any tax is automatically bad. We're even told that in kindergarten. The American Revolution was because of taxes. And so it's ingrained in people that somehow their money is being stolen. And granted, they're not getting a lot of payback when the money just goes for wars for the most part. You know, if they saw things like they could see a doctor, they could get on a bus for free, they could go to university for free, they'd probably be more willing to pay taxes. One thing, I'm, idea I'm trying to float out there again for people, I know it may not 
be quite time to form demands in the Occupy movement. Ultimately, you're going to have to, or no demands or desires are ever going to be met, yes, basically. Yes, certainly. That's, that's um, one thing we've noticed here. And this is a complicated, unsexy one, and not necessarily one of the ones most likely to win on, but I do think it's good to throw out what is possible and cool ideas, even if it doesn't look like they're going to go through right away. As far as taxes go, let people, you put maybe a dozen or 15 boxes on people's tax forms where they can rank what percentage of their tax dollar they want to go where. In the case of my country, it would mean that uh, education and the environment would go straight up and uh, the military budget and the drug war would go straight down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, letting people vote with their tax dollars so they see that they're getting something back is a great way of gutting all this Tea Party crap, which at least in the case of the United States, is being manipulated by wealthy Texas oil barons who funded the whole thing in the first place. We want government off our backs so we can have corporations on our backs instead, but don't we already? I don't know. <laughs> Jello, I must ask, as someone who has a 30-year history of dissent, you've seen social movements over that time period. What do you think is well? What do you do you think that the occupation movement is different, and how so? Right now, it's more of an uprising than a movement. It's an expression of anger. In a way, it's a cry for help, basically. You know, that we don't like corporate dictatorship turning every country into a third world banana republic with very, very rich people and very, very poor people. And that, that level of action and primal scream and the mere action of putting up tents in the middle of downtown where they want to put the big Christmas tree soon. That'll be an interesting thing. <laughs> if it isn't too unsafe, maybe you could come back and occupy the Christmas tree, you never know. Tree sitting was a good tactic with Earth First, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's a little harder to cut down the redwoods, but um, it's, it's at the beginning. I don't think it's bad right now that there isn't really a formal agenda or demands. I think ultimately there may not be 100% consensus on everything or you're never going to get anything done. I mean, some of the sadder things that Obama has caved in on in order to get a law passed, that was consensus. Everybody hates this the least, so we're going to have this kind of crappy health care instead of the crappy health care we already have. Or maybe consensus is the wrong word, but ultimately, you know, it's going to be interesting to see whether that drags things down or how people are able to work with that. It's also interesting to me, and in, in San Francisco, how many people were yelling democracy? It was just like Arab Spring, people yelling for something as basic as democracy, which is that we supposedly already have, but they're sick of corporate managed fake democracy. And for them, and for me, the mask is off. And already, according to a mainstream conservative pub corporate publication, I think you see down here called Time Magazine, they did a poll, and there were twice as many people, even out there in mainstream land, expressing sympathy for the Occupy movement than there were for the Tea Party. So that's good, because the Tea Party is supposed to be the official outlet for this kind of anger. You focus your anger on the disadvantaged. You focus your anger on people of color. You aim all your anger at a particular set of target politicians who are set up for you, just like in a carnival or something. You fire at them again and again, and America worry more about who's going to be president in 2012 than what's going on in 2011. That's the way they channel that rage. I mean, that, that's always been done. Even in the later years, you know, the communist dictators in Poland and East Germany had their own heavy metal bands. You know, let off your steam this way. Go government. But, so what do you think, but so like, Maybe I'm wandering again No, here, no, but, that's good. But but like, well, a, few other, a few other things that relate to this. Um, this tent city here is a lot further off the ground than the one in San Francisco. I don't know about New York, but because it had to be very temporary, might have to leave and run on a moment's notice, there aren't as many tents up, at least not yet, and I think they may finally have a kitchen that sets up and goes down, and the library just sits out on a bench of some books and things, so they have a library. 
but the, the legal liaison, first A, the place where they're showing the DVDs or whatever it is, uh, and I'm not sure they have that yet in San Francisco. It almost seems, it's almost more like it has, it has the outward look of a crafts fair, <laughs> which is not bad. I mean, rebellion is a craft too, especially when it's done craftily, shall we say. <laughs> so um, so I, I'm encouraged. I mean, I, I, I my impression of Australia the other times I've been here was that, yeah, most Australians are even more, shall we say, militantly apathetic than uh, Americans are, which takes some doing. But the other Australians who see the mask off and are into it are more hardcore. Mm -hmm. 